Hi, good morning, and welcome to Grand Rounds. Uh, we're really delighted to have Tina Park with us today, uh, one of our really, really wonderful faculty, and she is an assistant professor of medicine, the Icon School of Medicine at Mount Sinai, and then is uh, faculty mostly here at Mount Sinai St. Luke's in a division of gastroenterology, and she's also the director of quality for the division of gastroenterology across both hospitals. Tina received her undergraduate degree in, in molecular biology at Cornell, and then her MD from UMD and J. Robert Wood Johnson School of Medicine in New Jersey, completed her training in internal medicine at Brown University Medical Center, and then her fellowship in gastroenterology at University of Massachusetts. And she wasn't done then. She wanted to do one more fellowship and completed another fellowship in advanced endoscopy at Columbia University Medical Center and was recruited to our center uh, particularly related to that wonderful training that she's had in her expertise, as well as the great person that she is. As you all know, it's a lot of fun for me to review people's CVs. And one thing I didn't know about Tina, but it speaks to her dexterity also in the endoscopy lab, is she's an accomplished classically trained pianist going back many years and has performed at places like you might have heard of Carnegie Hall on more than one occasion, has won many awards nationally for her um, accomplishments as a pianist. As I say, it's really a delight for us to, to have the opportunity to bring to our uh, podium faculty in the department who are doing such wonderful things. And Tina, we're really psyched to have you here today and welcome. Good morning, everyone. Um, I'm Tina Park, and thank you for that kind introduction today, and thanks for having me today to be your speaker. Um, I've been asked to talk to you about gastric cancer and the role of endoscopy, particularly the role of endoscopic submucosal dissection today. Um, so today I'd like to give you a brief introduction to gastric cancer, going over classifications and risk and protective factors. A little bit about carcinogenesis and role of endoscopy in terms of screening, um, diagnosis, staging, and therapeutic options like EMR or ESD. We'll go over ESD outcomes today and surveillance guidelines as well. So gastric cancer is the fourth most common cancer worldwide, uh, accounted for 700,000 uh, deaths in 2012. Uh, it's the second, least, uh, second leading cause of death worldwide. Um, its incidence is highest in Eastern um, Asia, in East uh, Europe, South America, and it's not as prevalent in Africa or North America. The Lawrence classification divides gastric cancer into two main types. One is intestinal type, which is well differentiated, uh, tends to be slowly growing, affecting older population, uh, men more so than women. Um, it's associated with intestinal metaplasia, um, and it's found in uh, the distal uh, stomach and the antrum more so than the body or the cardia. This type is more prevalent in Asia, uh, parts of Europe and South America, whereas the diffuse type uh, tends to be poorly differentiated, more aggressive, scattered throughout the stomach. Uh, it's quicker to metastasize and affects men and women equally, particularly in the younger population. Uh, when looking at the stomach, um, this is the antrum body and the top portion is the cardia. Um, though gastric cancer is more prevalent in Asia, uh, now we're finding out that uh, cardiac cancer uh, incidence is rising in the Western countries, particularly in the Caucasian population. So here are some risk factors for gastric cancer. Um, older age, male sex, smoking, family history of gastric cancers, H. pylori infections, chronic atrophic gastritis, intestinal metaplasia, uh, certain types of gastric polyps, um, and hereditary syndromes. So the peak incidence for gastric cancer is aged between 50 to 70. Uh, only 1% um, of cases occur between ages 20 to 34, whereas 29% um, occur between ages 75 and 84. Uh, when comparing um, individuals with BMI less than 25 with those with BMI 30 to 35, um, people um, who are obese are at increased risk for particularly gastric cardiac cancer. 
Um, and there are a number of studies showing that um, having a BMI higher than 25 is associated with increased odds ratio for gastric cancer. H. pylori is uh, probably the only bacteria that's known to be a carcinogen. It's classified as class 1 carcinogen. It's found in 89% of distal gastric cancers. Um, the strains that are positive for virulent factor CAGA are particularly um, risky for in further increasing your cancer risk by 1.64 fold. Um, so this infection induces chronic inflammatory state, uh, which can cause uh, gastric atrophy. And from there, um, you can develop intestinal metaplasia, and from there, dysplasia can arise, uh, leading to cancer. The odds ratio for gastric cancer in age pylori infected individuals is 1.92, and a um, number of studies in Asia and Europe have shown that age pylori eradication resulted in lower rates of recurrence for gastric cancer um, and lower rates of metachromous cancer after resection. Um, and these factors like smoking, age pylori infections, high salt diet, or preserved foods for nitrates that can be converted to nitrous compounds. Um, they're all found to um, cause or induce atrophic gastritis. Um, in this state, uh, there's loss of parietal cells, and reduction in acid production. Uh, this then increases your serum gastrin levels and induces proliferation of your gastric epithelium. And in chronic long-standing atrophic gastritis, again, um, this can lead into intestinal metaplasia, which is a condition where your gastric epithelium starts to resemble that of small intestines or a large intestine. Um, and it can be quite uh, focal or limited to certain parts of the stomach um, without really discrete lesions, or it can be extensive involving the entire stomach. Uh, this condition has tenfold increased risk of gastric cancer compared to uh, those who do not have intestinal metaplasia. And in this study, you can see that all these conditions, gastritis, atrophic gastritis, intestinal metaplasia, and dysplasia, will increase your cumulative incidence of gastric cancer, but the red line here is the intestinal metaplasia that uh, puts you at particularly high risk for uh, gastric cancer. Um, there are a number of different gastric polyps. Uh, the fundic polyps are most common uh, types of polyps, and these are benign. They account for 70 to 90 percent of gastric polyps. Um, there are other types of polyps like hyperplastic and nomas. Um, hyperplastic polyps um, are generally uh, benign, but uh, those who are larger than one centimeter or pedunculated in shape uh, carries risk of malignancy. Um, in fact, 5 to 19 percent of hyperplastic gastric polyps carry focal uh, foci of dysplasia. And this appearance is quite different from um, our benign fundic gland polyps, which tends to have a smooth surface kind of sporadic um, scattered throughout the stomach. Um, and there are adenomas and similar to colon polyps, these are pre-cancerous uh, lesions found in the stomach and they should be removed. Um, and this accounts for 8 to 59 percent of, um, uh, they're associated with uh, gastric cancer. And there are a number of different hereditary syndromes um, that will increase your risk of gastric cancer as well. Um, hereditary diffuse gastric cancer is an autosomal dominant um, syndrome. Um, there is a cumulative risk for gastric cancer by age 80, 70% um, in men and 56% in women. Um, the average age uh, at diagnosis of gastric cancer in this condition is 38. And because of this, recommendation is to undergo prophylactic gastrectomy between the ages 20 to 30. Um, the condition here, uh, GAPPS, is also another autosomal dominant condition where gastric cancer occurs in um, as early as age 30s. Um, this is different from regular sporadic fundic polyps. This is a polyposis syndrome where there are hundreds of fundic polyps involving um, the stomach. Um, and as you know already, um, FAP, Lynch syndrome, Pitcher-Eggers syndrome will also increase your risk of gastric cancer. And here are some, some of the protective factors for gastric cancer. Um, there are animal studies showing that uh, COX-2 expression is upregulated in gastric cancer. It's involved in um, apoptosis and tumor growth. Um, and exposure to cigarette smoking or H. pylori infection, it has also, sh also been shown to induce COX-2. 
Um, so there are meta-analysis or core studies or um, prospect studies even showing reduction in risk of non-cardiac gastric cancer with regular use of aspirin or NSAIDs at least once a week over five years. Um, there are population studies showing that regular use of aspirin was found to be protective um, against gastric cancer as well. Um, um, however, there are not enough data for um, this to be incorporated into the guidelines currently, um, um, though there are a lot of research uh, showing that um, uh, this may be used for chemo prevention, not only for gastric cancer, but maybe even for colon cancer or Barrett's esophagus. In meta-analysis, um, physical activity um, has shown to be protective against gastric cancer. And um, there are some studies showing that vitamin C, um, as well as other antioxidants like beta-carotenes, can be protective. But there are uh, studies kind of mixed um, on this. There are other studies showing uh, no significant benefit in vitamin C in terms of prevention of gastric cancer. So here are some of the symptoms for gastric cancers. Um, abdominal pain, nausea, dyspepsia, early satiety, bleeding. Um, dysphagia if the lesion is in the cardia or near the G-junction, or weight loss. Um, I like to highlight that the symptoms may not be present in early ages, and many of them may be asymptomatic or have very vague or nonspecific symptoms. Uh, and maybe because of this, the survival, five-year survival rate from gastric cancer in the U.S. is quite low, around 20%. Um, interestingly, in Japan or South Korea, where gastric cancer is prevalent, their five-year survival rate is much higher um, in the 50s or even 70 percent for um, early stages. And for uh, very early stage intramucosal gastric cancers, their, high, uh, their survival rate is 95 percent. And again, that may be because a lot of patients may be asymptomatic until late stages. Uh, we don't currently have a screening program for gastric cancers in the U.S. Um, and for those who undergo endoscopies for other indications, uh, some of these pre-malignant lesions may be subtle or difficult to identify in endoscopy. Whereas in Japan or South Korea, they have screening programs uh, starting at age 40. All uh, patients undergo endoscopies every two years, regardless of symptoms. Um, and maybe um, the higher survival rate speaks to the effectiveness of mass screening programs, um, along with their therapeutic options like ESD, which is frequently performed in Asia. So again, um, chronic atrophic gastritis, um, this tends to lead into intestinal metaplasia, then can progress to low-grade dysplasia, high-grade dysplasia, um, intramucosal cancers, and then on to more invasive cancers. Um, the early gastric cancer kind of groups this whole um, three groups together. Um, and again, um, the scary part is that many patients may not have alarming symptoms until the late stages here. Um, as you can see on these pictures, um, gastritis or intestinal metaplasia may look very similar to normal stomach, such as here. Um, or intestinal metaplasia can be uh, found in this white, patchy, flat lesions. Um, and this is an example of a low-grade dysplasia, which, again, is a very subtle uh, finding on endoscopy. Uh, this is an example of a high-grade dysplasia lesion, um, and this is an intramucosal cancer, and this is more of an invasive cancer. Um, so not only they do not have symptoms, but um, uh, the uh, lesions may be very subtle in endoscopy, and um, the rate of progression from dysplasia to cancer uh, can be as high as 73% per year, which is very high. Um, so 25% of uh, patients diagnosed with high-grade dysplasia um, have found to be diagnosed also with cancer within one year of their diagnosis. Um, Low-grade dysplasia uh, tends to progress to cancer um, in 30% of cases over a median uh, period of 10 to 48 months. Um, High-grade dysplasia uh, can progress to cancer in 60 to 85 percent of cases over a median period of 4 to 48 months. So the goal here is to try to identify dysplastic lesions early on so that we can offer endoscopic therapy, which can be curative. 
So how do we identify lesions? Uh, one may be to have a screening program, um, and uh, second might be to utilize um, chroma endoscopy, high magnification endoscopy, or narrowband imaging, which helps us uh, visualize lesions better. And once we have um, identified intestinal metaplasia, then we should be taking um, adequate biopsies from the stomach, at least two from the interim, uh, one from the incisura, and two from the body of the stomach to ensure that we're looking actively for uh, changes like dysplasia. Uh, screening programs in South Korea, I believe, was adopted in 1996. And since launching their screening programs, uh, their detection of early gastric cancers increased from 28% in 1995 to 57% in 2009. And their five-year survival rates from gastric cancer increased uh, significantly from low 60s to high 70% over a 10-year period of time. Um, we do not currently have a screening protocol or guidelines in the U.S. Um, however, uh, we should consider offering screening to immigrants from high-risk locations, um, certainly for first generations, 1.5 generations, or even for second generations. And for those who are not from these areas or born in the U.S., we can consider selectively screening high-risk group populations, those with intestinal metaplasia, those with gastric adenomas, or family history of gastric cancer. So chroma endoscopy utilizes different dyes to help us identify lesions. The most common types used in the U.S. is endocarmine methylene blue. Um, it's a blue liquid that you spray onto the stomach during endoscopy. It falls into pits and grooves, and um, as you can see here on white light endoscopy, the lesion in this area is kind of difficult to see. You can see the lumpy, bumpy areas here, but the border isn't very clear. But after chromal endoscopy, you can better outline the border of the lesion. Uh, Lugol is a really interesting solution. Uh, it's an iodine-based solution that it's absorbed by normal squamous cell epithelium. It turns the normal cell dark brown while leaving the dysplastic areas white and normal, uh, unstained. So here is an example of squamous cell carcinoma of the esophagus. Um, again, kind of flattish, difficult to identify under white light endoscopy. After staining, uh, you can better identify the lesion of dysplasia and cancer here. MBI uses different bands of light to highlight the capillary pit patterns in the epithelium. So on white light endoscopy, uh, it may be difficult to distinguish normal versus abnormal area. Um, but under MBI, you can better see that the normal area has regularly spaced uh, capillary pit patterns whereas abnormal areas tends to have crowding or irregularly spaced capillary pit patterns. And in Asia, um, they utilize this along with high magnification endoscopy quite often, where the endoscopists are trained to look at this and can accurately predict before biopsy results what type of polyps they're dealing with. Um, so these type of lesions where they are regularly spaced, uh, even and homogeneous shape, uh, to it. This is more of a hyperplastic or benign lesions. As you progress towards cancer, um, there's loss of uh, organization, um, avascular areas, and capillary crowding, and this is a sign of more invasive cancer involving the deep submucosal layers. And combined with chromal endoscopy and high magnification endoscopy, again, this is another way to look at capillary pit patterns. In hyperplastic or benign lesions, they are regularly spaced. Um, as compared to uh, invasive cancers, there's loss of vascularity and organization. And these pit patterns help us to identify and classify lesions, and then which helps us determine best therapy to treat these lesions. So when you screen and look for these lesions and give uh, patients diagnosis, uh, once you've made a diagnosis of intestinal metaplasia, the European um, guidelines weigh these patients with endoscopy every three years with um, biopsies that we discussed previously to look for dysplastic lesions. Uh, for those with gastritis or intestinal metaplasia, uh, we should look for H. pylori infections, and if present, they should be treated and H. pylori should be eradicated. For low-grade and high-grade lesions, and even for intramucosal lesions um, that are not involving the submucosa, not involving the lymph nodes or vascular systems, um, these lesions can be treated with endoscopy. Um, um, and we'll talk about the ESD technique in a minute. 
Um, and if you happen to find these lesions um, accidentally on your biopsies and there's no discrete lesions, then that's a tough case, but the recommendation is to them to repeat the endoscopy immediately to look for lesions and to repeat them every six months. Uh, for invasive cancers, our uh, recommendation is to proceed with surgery and or chemotherapy or radiation therapy depending on their stage. So EOS uses uh, white light endoscopy to look at the mucosa um, with a camera, but then we have an ultrasound probe next to the camera that allows us to look into deeper layers of the stomach wall. Um, and this is good for local staging, particularly T staging and N staging, where we look at, where we look at uh, depth of invasion for lesions. So this is an example of a lesion in the stomach, um, and it's involving the top four layers, uh, the mucosa, uh, deep mucosa, submucosa, and muscular propria. Uh, when the lesion is very superficial, involving um, only the top two layers, um, this is T1A lesion. Um, if it involves a submucosal layer, then that becomes T1B lesion. When it invades into the muscular propria, it becomes T2, and into the serosa, it becomes T3, and beyond the serosa into the peritoneum or adjacent organs, it becomes T4. We can look for also presence of abnormal lymph nodes and uh, pass a needle to biopsy these lymph nodes for, uh, to look for malignant involvement. When there are multiple lymph nodes, uh, that determines, uh, depending on the number of the lymph nodes, determines end staging. And CT scan is useful for looking for distal metastases. So depending on um, which T, N, or M staging, you can then determine the staging of your gastric cancer. And for um, early superficial cancers involving just the mucosal layer, ESD can be applied uh, to treat these cancers. Whereas those that involve uh, the deeper layers of the stomach or the lymph nodes, they may benefit from surgery and or uh, chemotherapy. So ESD is a technique um, that was actually developed in Japan to treat early gastric lesions in the 1990s. Since then, it's been used to also remove superficial cancer lesions from other parts of the GI tract, such as Barrett's esophagus, adenocarcinoma, uh, squamous cell carcinoma of the esophagus, large colonic lesions, carrying dysplasia. And the goal here is to remove um, dysplastic lesions or cancerous lesions uh, by endoscopy in one piece, uh, that's called an unblock resection, with negative lateral and vertical margins. Um, so when we say curative complete resection or RO resection, we're talking about um, cancerous lesions coming out in one piece with negative margins. And we can accomplish this by using um, regular endoscope uh, with uh, different types of knives and devices that we have to dissect the lesions. And we have coagraspers and other devices to help control bleeding um, and to treat complications. This technique is indicated for early gastric cancer lesions um, involving the mucosal layer, um, less than two centimeters, that are well differentiated, not ulcerated, and without lymphovascular invasion. Um, this is the absolute criteria for gastric ESD. Um, the Japanese guidelines have then extended their criteria to also include poorly differentiated cancers, um, less than two centimeters, um, those that involve the submucosal layer for less than 500 microgram, uh, micrometers um, in depth, um, and those that are larger than two centimeters, as, it, as long as they're not ulcerated and well differentiated. And again, um, the steps involved are that we're, we're going to identify the border of the lesion and mark around the lesion to ensure that we can get negative margins. We'll inject a solution underneath the lesion into the submucosal layer to lift it away from the muscle layer. And then under vision, we will um, make a circumferential incision around the lesion um, and then dissect in the submucosal layer until the lesion comes off completely. And I have a video of this, and unfortunately, I think the video within the presentation is not playing, so let me just toggle back and forth. I apologize. So here is a gastric cancer lesion in the body of the stomach, and now we're using 
our uh, needle to mark around the lesions so that we can have a uh, margin of normal tissue. We're using a needle to inject underneath uh, the lesion into the submucosal layer so the whole thing has lifted. And now we're using the knives to um, make our circumferential incision. Um, this is done under endoscopy, um, and we take our time and are very careful in dissecting the lesion with the knives. And soon you'll see that there is a submucosal layer here, which is this kind of a foamy, whitish uh, layer. So here is the gastric cancer lesion uh, to the right of us, and to the left of us is the muscle layer, and beyond this is the peritoneum. So we have a very little space to work with, but it's a really cool, innovative technique to be able to remove cancerous lesions under vision at the level of submucosa. Uh, now, sometimes during the dissection, you'll um, see vessels. Um, and there's actually a vessel coming up right here towards the right of us. Uh, when this happens, so we can use coagulation on um, our needle to um, ligate or coagulate the vessels. And we kind of continue on with this technique um, forward until we reach the other side of the margin and until the whole cancer cancer station comes off. You have to be careful of not going too further into the muscle layer. That can result in perforation. Um, we have to be also careful of not cutting too closely to the cancer lesion um, because we want to ensure that they can have negative margins. So now this is the final stage where the lesion comes off. And this is a resection bed. So cancer lesion in the middle, uh, negative margin of that. So the outcome uh, that we know from uh, the Asian studies show that um, the on-block resection rates for ESD for gastric cancer is quite high, um, as high as 92 to 100 percent. And our O resection, curative resection rates are also high at 82 to 92 percent. Um, and this carries on to other types of cancers. Um, the resection rates for squamous cell carcinoma of the esophagus or adenocarcinoma of the esophagus is in the 90s, for clonic lesions also in the high 90s. Um, the local recurrence rate of cancers for gastric cancer is quite low at 0.07% um, and also uh, quite low for other types of cancers. Um, two major complications we worry after ESD are delayed bleeding, which can occur in 0 to 15% of cases, and a perforation. Um, to prevent delayed bleeding, we can actively pro uh, prophylactically treat any visible vessels. Uh, we can treat active bleeding with um, our clip devices, our injection needles, or coag graspers. And here is a I'm going to toggle back and forth one more time. Here is a resection bed after ESC. There is a bit of bleeding you notice from six o'clock position from a vessel. We're going to grab that vessel with our coagulospers, and you can notice that temporarily the bleeding has stopped when we grab that vessel. When we let go, uh, there's actually active bleeding from this vessel. Um, so we're again going to grab that vessel with our coagulospers, which then um, stops the bleeding. We're going to apply our um, RB um, our heat to coagulate the vessels, and after that, the hemostasis has been achieved. And uh, same thing, if a perforation were to happen, uh, we can try to close with our clip devices, but we can then also use our suturing devices to close the perforation. Um, a lot of times we actually opt to prophylactically close our ESD sites uh, with our suturing devices. Uh, this is a suturing device that goes on the tip of the endoscope, 
we're uh, passing a needle device with the sutures back and forth between these two um, handles. And we placed our first bite um, on this side of the uh, resection bed, second bite on the other side, and we'll kind of purse string this closed um, like so. Okay, and this technique is different from our traditional way of resecting polyps or lesions. Um, and EMR um, is a technique where that's similar to ESD. We inject underneath the uh, lesion to give that mucosal lift away from the muscle layer. But instead of dissecting under vision with knives, um, we can use snare device to close uh, and resect the lesion. Um, the advantage to this is that it's a less complicated procedure um, that involves shorter procedure time. The disadvantage is that we're not really visualizing the submucosal layer to really ensure the negative margins. Um, and here is a video of EMR. So this is a uh, gastric lesion in the distal body. We're injecting underneath this uh, to lift it away from the muscle layer. This is a snare device that goes on top, and we're going to slowly try to close the snare um, and try to keep the entire lesion within the snare device. Uh, when we close, we can apply uh, cautery and cutting um, current to resect the lesion. And after resection, um, you can see the resection bed. Um, so, the problem with EMR um, is that sometimes the snare slips off of the lesions, leaving a little bit of residual tissue behind. So this will be a failed on block resection, and this will have to be removed in piecemeal fashion, which is associated with a higher risk of recurrence. Um, there were in this case that resulted in perforation because you grabbed too much of the muscle layer. So compared to EMR, ESD was associated with higher rates of on block resection, 92% uh, versus 52%. Higher rates of complete resection, curative resection, 82% versus 42%. And lower rates of recurrence um, at 1% versus 6%. Um, however, ESD was associated with longer procedure time, 85 minutes versus 35 minutes, higher rates of perforation, 4 versus 1%, and higher rates of intraoperative bleeding, though ultimately there was no difference in delayed bleeding rates or mortality rate. And again, um, the key point here is that when you're looking at ESD versus EMR, when resecting early gastric lesions, the local recurrence rate uh, was much higher in the EMR compared to ESD group, uh, especially if the lesion was not removed in one piece. So piecemeal resection EMR has the highest rates of local recurrence rate. Um, as compared to ESD in this group, they have zero recurrence rates. How does it compare to surgery? So this is looking at um, ESD versus surgery for differentiated cancer uh, using the Japanese expanded criteria. And studies have shown that the length of hospital stay is much shorter for ESD group compared to surgery group. And ESD was associated with lower rates of complication compared to surgery. Um, the procedure-related mortality rate was also significantly lower in ESD group compared to surgery. Significant difference in recurrence rate or five years survival rate between the two groups. Um, and this is from Asian um, studies. I'm not sure how this correlates um, to the U.S. dollars necessarily, but the key point here is that ESD was uh, much more cost-effective than surgery. Um, this is another large uh, center trial looking at ESD versus surgery for early uh, gastric cancer in the intramucosal and submucosal layers. Um, their overall survival rate um, was not different between the two groups. Um, and the local recurrence rate was also not significantly different. Um, however, ESD group had lower rates of complications and again, shorter uh, length of stay compared to the surgical group.
So after ESD, the management and surveillance really is depends on histology. Um, if the lesion that you have resected completely is uh, well differentiated mucosal and meets these criteria, or even in the submucosal layer, it's in the top uh, 500 micrometers, then the chances of lymph node metastases is very low at 0 to 1%. Um, 0.2% if you follow the absolute criteria. So in these cases, um, if you achieve on block complete resection, ESD is considered to be curative. Um, and afterwards, um, what you recommend um, is endoscopy every three to six months and then annually uh, for surveillance. Um, if you remove the lesion, but the lesion type is poorly differentiated, larger in size, um, with invasion into the submucosal layer, or you have positive margins, then your lymph node metastases is quite high, as high as 20%. So these patients. Not only a therapeutic tool, but this can also help provide accurate diagnosis. There's a number of cases where um, lesions have been identified as low grade dysplastic lesion based on endoscopy biopsies. Which is taking a little bit of tissue from the top using these biopsy forceps. So as you can see here, this low-grade dysplastic lesions after ESD um, have found to be actually carrying theories of intramucosal adenocarcinoma. And in studies, they found that um, when they take lesions with low-grade dysplasia um, after ESD, about seven percent of them were upgraded to high-grade dysplasia, and eight percent of them were upgraded to adenocarcinoma. And this is actually a picture of my ESD patient who was referred to me for non-healing gastric ulcer uh, with biopsies uh, showing evidence of high-grade dysplasia. Um, we've done the ESD here, and you can see in the submucosal layer, unlike the video I've shown you, um, there are lots of fibrosis and scarring and lots of vascular areas. And the um, final path that actually came back as poorly differentiated adenocarcinoma. So our lesion was also upgraded from high grade to adenocarcinoma. Uh, luckily, we were able to have negative margins both vertically and laterally. And this was considered to be curative resection, and the patient did quite well. So in conclusion, um, though the prevalence of gastric cancer is highest in Asia, its incidence, um, particularly in cardiac gastric cancer, is rising in the Western countries. Um, alarming symptoms may not be present early on for early gastric cancers. Um, so we should consider screening uh, the high-risk population. And ESD can offer a curative resection for early gastric cancers or intramucosal cancers uh, without surgery. Um, and ESD was associated with lower complication rate, cost, and shorter length of stay compared to surgery. Thank you for your attention today. So um, studies actually surprisingly have found that smoking but not alcohol raises your risk of gastric cancer. And I'm not quite sure pathophysiology-wise why that may be. Um, but I do think that um, the pathogenesis that I've shown you here uh, with a COX-2 um, COX expression, um, smoking and H. pylori seems to be the main ones that induces that. And, kind of alters your um, apoptosis or tumor growth. So uh, it's not clear to me why the alcohol doesn't raise um, your risk as much as smoking does, but studies have not pan out to show the correlation necessarily with alcohol, but more so with smoking. Um, there aren't really studies to suggest that PPI uh, with acid suppression then increases your risk, risk of um, gastric cancer. Um, it seems like um, chronic atrophic state whether it be from smoking, H. pylori, or pernicious anemia, whatever the state may be, post-gastric, gastrectomy state, 
um, is the main mechanism that then kind of carries over to the area of intestinal metaplasia. The PPI use itself has not been proven to actually cause intestinal metaplasia or poor dysplasia, so I don't think there is sufficient evidence to show PPI use correlation with gastric cancer. Sure. So I think um, the obesity raises your risk of cardiac gastric cancer. So in when my gastric bypass anatomy, where there's excluded stomach, but more so uh, involving the distal stomach, I think um, you're still able to kind of look and screen for lesions in the cardiac, which is in your proximal stomach and should be visible in post red y anatomy. Um, as for your first question with obesity and role of screening, again, we don't have sufficient data or guidelines to suggest that we should be actively screening for these people, but I'll say the screening probably is very similar to Barrett's esophagus in terms of looking at obesity or reflux or chronic states where there's damage um, to the proximal stomach near the J-junction. So I think if patients are coming in anyways for uh, reflux and Barrett's screening because they meet the criteria, whether it be based on their waste smoking or obesity, um, I think we should be actively looking also um, at the cardia uh, with retroflexion to look for gastric lesions, uh, not only for Barrett's esophagus. Um, again, it's a very uh, tough question to answer. Um, and um, I think we'll probably have more data coming up in the next 20 years or so as we see more cardiac cancers in the Western states. Um, but I think for now, uh, we should all for screening for those people from um, high-risk locations, um, those people who are coming in for Barrett's esophagus screening, uh, for those uh, who have conditions like intestinal metaplasia on um, biopsies, um, we should actively follow up and offer screening um, so that you know, we can try to catch these dysplastic lesions early on. Tina, thanks for a great talk. And again, we're really kind of thrilled to know about your expertise in this area. I did that. Just tease out for me, if you would, uh, H. pylori as a carcinoma in two veins. One, if we were creating a screening program, would there be an argument say in high risk populations, the first step in that program would just be to look for H. pylori. And then second, um, is there any data about duration of infection or you know, purported duration of infection or likelihood of developing a malignancy? So there's no data um, showing that um, right now. Um, and actually, they've looked into prophylactically just treating for H. pylori population-wide to see if that actually reduces your cancer. Um, that does not pan out to actually so, show reduction in gastric cancer, interestingly, so I don't think it's just the H. pylori infection, which truly is a multifactorial uh, disease. Uh, but if you were to set up a screening program, I do think that it makes sense to actively look for H. pylori and offer eradication. Um, particularly if that person has any type of atrophic gastritis, um, because studies have shown that if you cure and eradicate H. pylori, your recurrence rate after resection rate therapy is much lower, and it is found in 89% of cases. So, so there's no clear study seeing that it doesn't always prevent cancer. I think it makes sense logically to look for those infections. Um, it's cost effective to treat them. It's not difficult to. It's not invasive testing. So I think um, if we were to set up a um, screening program, that does absolutely make sense to look for H. pylori and treat for H. pylori. Can I ask a question about that? Yes. Uh, could you uh, discuss a little bit the relationship of diet to uh, gastric cancer? Uh, for instance, uh, in the popular, the popular 
diet or use of preservatives or anything that contains a lot of nitrates then is uh, reduced in the stomach by different bacteria into like n nitrates of compounds which is a carcinogen um, have found to be um, correlated with increased risk of gastric cancer in population studies as you mentioned um, I think regionally speaking Asian uh, foods uh, whether it be South Korea or Japan um, have traditionally have had um, uh, like a pickled foods or salty uh, foods. Um, so that is thought to be somewhat correlated with the regional effect that you are describing. Um, again, it's not just the diet itself. I think it truly is a multifactorial disease where um, I think in Japan there is about 90% of the H. pylori strains there have or carry the virulence factors. So it may be a combination not only with the diet, but also with a type of H. pylori strain that they, that's prevalent in Japan, plus um, the family uh, history, plus genetics and other number of factors that all contribute to the high prevalence that we're seeing in Japan. And again, um, numbers like that have shown that, uh, particularly in China, Japan, and South Korea, that vitamin C or you know um, diet that's really high in fruits and vegetables and antioxidants um, are thought to really decrease your cancer risk. Uh, we have not seen something similar in um, Europe or in the States. So again, I'm not sure why there's disparities in these um, studies uh, yet, but there are mixed data showing that maybe uh, and high antioxidant diet, vitamin C may be helpful. Um, avoiding salt, uh, preserved with pickle foods may also be helpful. Um, but again, I, I think it's uh, it's Difficult to answer just based on diet or just based on H. pylori. I think it's a multifactorial thing that contributes towards high prevalence in Japan compared to um, U.S. Yeah, just have one other question about your patient. Okay. You said that uh, the diagnosis was made by way of her non-healing gastric ulcer. I'm yes. just curious, was she persistently symptomatic, or was there something about her that made you think she needed? Sure. Um, so we routinely, um, so the patient presented with abdominal pain and nausea and uh, <clears throat> endoscopy that found uh, a gastric ulcer. We routinely treat these ulcers with PPI, BIV for eight weeks, and we routinely bring them back for endoscopies to make sure they have healed. Um, the non-healing ulcers, you have to worry about cancer causing the ulcerations. Um, so I think his case, um, we found that just by following our own protocol, which is treating them with PPIs and uh, bringing them back for endoscopy to check healing. Yeah. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you very much.